Mr. Decor, Pamela, for giving this opportunity to share with you some thoughts about one of the areas that I've been investigating um, recently. Uh, finally, after almost two and a half years uh, since I moved to come to I have the opportunity to be a core and talk about my work and do it in a sort of academic way rather than only over drinks in a, in a, in a reformer way. And I'm very, very pleased to, to be here. So, what I want to share with you is the stage of my research on the relationship between finance and the food system. So this is a work that started in 2015 with a group that is called the Food and Finance Network. Uh, we had a first meeting in The Hague uh, where we tried to put together academics, activists and civil society organizations interested in thinking of the way in which finance and financial actors were reshaping or affecting uh, the food system. So what is produced, where is produced, what we eat, but especially who gets to eat and who doesn't get to eat. So the group has been on stall for a little bit, but we are meeting again in May 25th in London at City University. So if anyone is interested, whether the people here present or the people online, uh, please get in touch with me. We are really trying to boost it again because I, we believe that there is much more that needs to be done and much investigation that has to be conducted on this um, interruption. So, using technology, um, I have a broad outline. Uh, what I really wanted to do today is to share with you some examples and some cases that I think demonstrate why it is important to think about finance when we think about the present and, even more importantly, the future of the food system. So, the idea is to start with this concept and this idea that we are moving towards, or we are ready into the third food regime, uh, which is the food regime of finance, or maybe the fourth one, if we consider the third one, the corporate food regime. And then through examples, moving towards some reflections and some ideas of why we should all uh, consider finance if we are interested in, in, in food. So, the starting point uh, is a picture that you may be familiar with that shows the level of concentration and the level of uh, homogenization of the dominant or conventional food system from the perspective of the consumer. Very few brands owning or determining much of the food that can be found in a supermarket. So, of course, this is a picture that doesn't represent the food system that I'd like to see, but unfortunately it represents the food system that is expanding in specific geographies of the world in particular. So looking at this picture, we could be saying, oh, very few corporate players are owning the food, are owning the food system, and are owning and are making decisions about what we get to eat, but also determining, with their market power and the bargaining power, the entire food chain that they belong to. What I think is important to say is that that picture doesn't tell the entire story, that there is a story behind that picture that has to be said which is who actually owns, who actually makes decisions concerning those corporations, who actually has the financial power or the financial interest behind those corporations. And if we think about the same picture through the eyes of finance, we will see that unfortunately, the entire story is even bigger and it's even more problematic. So I think what has been happening and what I, we are trying to look at with the Food and Finance um, Research Network is this transition between a food system that was dominated by corporate actors into a food system, a global food system, a conventional food system, is increasingly dominated by financial players. So, the idea is that the food system, as many other sectors of the global economy, is increasingly shaped and controlled by financial actors. This is what Epstein is covering the is called financialization, there's the increasing role of financial motives, financial markets, financial actors, and financial institutions in operation of the domestic and international economies. So, said like that, it means a lot and nothing. It means that financial motives and financial actors, like private equity funds, hedge funds, investment banks, and etc., are increasingly participating in the economy, and their presence is defining both the local and the international level. So, starting from this recognition, the, the understanding that finance is important and is shaping both 
daily practices and international practices. And I would say that the crisis in 2008-2010 was an eye-opener in the sense of how much our daily life is defined by financial actors. We started investigating as a network whether or not the food system was also affected and to what extent these presence of financial motives, financial actors, financial desires, financial terms was changing the food that we see and the food system that we engage with. But before we looked at that, we decided to, or the way in which I start this presentation, is to also look at what a lot of us was considering the only way in which finance was affecting the food system. So, Traditionally, especially after 2008-2009, the, the crisis uh, of the food peak and the uh, increasing prices of global stocks, the way in which the relationship between food and finance was discussed was about commodity speculation, was about this greedy financiers buying and selling food on financial markets, and by that intervention determining the price of food. So that was pretty clear in 2008, 2009. There was a lot of literature that came out at the time saying that because it is possible to buy and sell food commodities, wheat, corn, beef, oranges, on the financial market, the price of what we buy and the price of, of food on the market is also determined and defined by speculative engagement on the market. So there is a lot said and a lot written about that, and that's not the area that I've been covering. I do recommend this very um, straightforward book by Luigi Russi on Hungry Capital that somehow uh, runs through the entire history of the connection between financial speculation and the food system. So when we started thinking about food and finance, we had to look at that because that was what people were talking about. Talking about speculation, talking about the problems with financialization and the fact that you could buy a future on the production of wheat without being really interested in the wheat itself, that investment banks could be trading and affecting the cost and the price on the grounds of the farmers and people would be affected. So we looked at that and we tried to go a little bit further and say, okay, but how is that actually affecting uh, on the ground? And so we collected some, some, some data and some statistics. So the classic example is that of coffee. So 95% of the coffee that is traded on those markets is trading without any effective transaction, which means that 95% of the value of the coffee globally is not coffee that is traded, but it's pieces of paper paper representing coffee. And these are the so-called futures, these are documents that give the possibility to bet on the future price of coffee. So 95% of what represents coffee is actually not coffee, it's just a piece of paper. Um, similarly, um, Chicago Soft Red Winter Futures, so that's a specific uh, product that can be bought in the Chicago Stock Exchange, and that represents the production of wheat, one of the standards of wheat, or two standards, during one day of transaction, there is a value in the dollars term, in economic terms, that represents the whole production of that specific kind of wheat in the year. So in one year, in one day in Chicago, traders and speculative investors trade the same amount of, the, of value that is produced during the year. So numbers are completely schizophrenic. So what happens in the financial level is completely detached and separated from what happened on the ground. But then we saw that there are connections. So what happens on the financial market has an implication on the ground. And we discovered two examples, one that I saw directly when I was doing some field work, and the other one that is um, uh, reported in, um, in an article concerning um, American culture. So in the face of coffee, what we saw, and what I saw by, by talking with farmers on the ground, was that the possibility of using financial instruments, so the possibility of speculating or investing on the market, was giving a form of protection to traders that farmers did not have access to. And to say that in, in, in simple terms, when farmers were asked to sell their production, the traders were offering a price. And the trader was offering a price to the farmer 
in that specific moment didn't want to accept because they thought that the price was lower than the price for raw coffee that they were willing to pay. So the farmers decided to wait and the traders would wait. So days would pass and the trader would go back and ask the farmer if the farmers wanted to sell. And the farmers again thought that the price wasn't high enough and so they <coughs> wouldn't sell. And the dynamic was going on and on. And I spent almost two weeks of seeing this dynamic repeated every day. And then at a certain point, the farmer, whose income is mainly determined by the possibility of selling coffee in the market and that needed the money for personal and family needs, had to sell the coffee. And at the moment, I was like, okay, so the farmer is losing, the trader is losing because they waited for two weeks. And so it's a lose-lose scenario. What I discovered is that at the same time that the farmers were not buying coffee materially, they were not buying coffee from the farmers, they were trading on the financial market. So for them, those two weeks where they were not trading in coffee were two weeks of opportunity to take the money and use the money that they didn't pay the farmers to bet on the market and to protect themselves or to make money out of the fluctuation of the price of the market. So when the trader, after two weeks, went back to the farmer and offered another price, the trader already had the money generated from the market. So for the trader, it was not a problem. So what I saw was that it was clearly intensifying the imbalance of power between those who could have access to financial instruments that would give extra revenues and extra protection versus the farmers on the ground, which at the end of the day, for personal and systemic reasons, have to sell the product. But something similar, although a little bit different, is also happening in conventional agriculture in the United States, where it is uh, assume that everyone has access to financial products so that they can protect their harvest. Uh, it is considered to be one of the most financialized agricultural sectors in the world. But what the study um, has reported is that because of the participation of financial speculators and non-agricultural uh, firms to the market of financial products, so because Goldman Sachs is interested in the same uh, futures that farmers are interested in, the cost of this product is, is increasing, is rising. So the availability of these products for farmers is decreasing because they cannot afford anymore. So in the article, they talk about the rural 1%, which is that little elite of large-scale farmers who can afford buying futures and financial products and protect their harvest, while the rest, 99% of farmers, they don't have the resources anymore because these products have become too expensive because of the participation of financial actors, financial investors on the market. So what happened in Chicago, what happened in New York, is having direct impact on the ground for farmers, both in the global south and in the global north. And just to make things more complicated, an article in 2016 showed that agricultural commodities have become one of the commodities that are traded in the high frequency trading system. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, and not that much, because it's pretty complicated, but these are transactions that are made by computers on the basis of logarithm. So there are not people anymore deciding to buy one ton of wheat for a future on the price of oranges in 2020. It's a computer that applying the logarithm and applying a mathematical formula that has been defined and included in the system, it automatically sends signals and send buying and selling um, messages. And that means that a logarithm, if it's true that financial markets have an impact on power imbalances, have an impact on farmers, it can be a computer and a logarithm in the future if that continues and it doesn't get curved and doesn't get regulated, it could be a logarithm to decide the future of farmers and to decide also the future of food. But as I said, it's not only about, unfortunately, it's not only about speculation, it's not only about financial markets, it's about the way in which financial interests and financial actors are permeating and reshaping the whole food system. So what is happening is that financial actors, private equity funds, investment funds, pension funds, insurance funds, etc. They are increasingly looking at the global food system as a rentable, reliable, and profitable sector. So they are increasingly investing 
both along the food chain, so vertically integrating, what would be called from farm to fork, but also horizontally integrating. So buying shares and uh, packets of shares in potentially competing firms so that they can control or participate in decision making of different firms within the same sector. And I will give you an example of, of that. And of course, you can imagine that if you have same actors and same finances occupying and controlling different steps of the food chain, both vertically and horizontally, that has a significant impact in the terms of what is produced, where is produced, how is value generated, where is value allocated, and the bargaining power that can be exercised for those farmers and consumers. So there is a lot of squeezing value out of the uh, out of the chain because financial investors are interested in remunerating themselves and extracting value, but there is also a lot of master puppeteering in the sense of deciding and determining how the food system looks like. So as I said, I will give you some examples that show how finance is integrated in the food system from far to fork, but I'll go the other way around. I'll start from fork and I'll go to far, also because the area of interest that I've been looking more closely at is that of financialization plan, so the origin of the food system. So, I got interested in, in delivery and the so-called delivery revolution for other reasons, uh, for the way in which workers are treated and for the way in which the experience of food is changing. And I've always got fascinated by the fact that a company is telling us that, are telling us that we don't have to cook anymore, that the only thing that we have to do is to eat and, and, and someone else will provide us with the food. So I was pretty much disturbed by that. And, but then I, I by, by all the things that they're doing, and I hope that they listen to that. Um, <laughs> but what I also realized is that this specific sector has become particularly appealing and attractive for financial investors. So in the UK only, the sector has been increasing rapidly in the last four years and has been attracted investment from global um, investment firms. Uh, global investors, for example, are particularly interested in Uber and Uber Eats, who receive, I think, $10 billion from a um, Saudi Arabia World Fund that thought that it was a rentable and reliable and appealing investment to put $10 billion into the future of transportation, to their future of transportation, their future of food. But what is happening on the ground is that, on the one hand, you have an increase in delivery thanks to the amount of money that's pumped into, into the sector, that's attracting more and more money, but that has an impact on the other way in which food is produced and consumed. So in the UK, the restaurant sector has been losing, uh, in absolute terms, more than the delivery system has been losing. Restaurants shutting down, they are firing um, waiters, they are firing cooks, they are just keeping their kitchen and only working for delivery. So the decision that is made in terms of the economic viability and the economic appealing and the financial appealing for these actors has concrete implication on the food system at the most local level, which is labor, employment, the way in which food is distributed locally. But Uber Eats Delivery and Just Eat generate high revenues and high returns that can satisfy the desires of government sites and sovereign world funds. So, from delivery, so the future is going to be delivered apparently because financial investors have decided that we will not cook anymore. The next step is that of retailers and retailing. So one of the areas in the food system that has been increasingly attractive for financial investment has, has been that of large-scale retailing. So specifically, I collected some information from the, from the US. We've been seeing financial investors like Cerberus Capital, which is a private equity fund, investing money and consolidating competitors and creating even bigger retailers with even larger uh, logistic uh, system, with even more concentrated facilities and the need of less and less employers, uh, employees. Sorry. So on the one hand, you have this idea that the future is retailing, the future is large scale, the future is the food that you really find on the shelves of the supermarket, and the future is increasingly a future where small-scale, local, 
um, shops, etc., don't exist because they are incapable of generating the revenues that these players want to see. And as you can see from uh, investor studies at Moody's, the primary reasons is that grocery stores and supermarket chains from healthy cash flows, private equity firms, and the opportunity to extract cash dividends and boost returns. So the only and exclusive reason why they're doing that is because they know that people need to buy food and they know that there's always going to be a cash flow coming from retailers. Specifically, if these large scale retailers are going to be the only places where people can buy food. So again, there's an interest in creating a specific food system that is concentrated on a few places uh, that can generate high returns. Connected to, to retail, uh, there's also the history of Whole Foods uh, that you may know is that one the sort of chain of supermarkets in the US that was considered to be the natural, fair, not really organic, but sort of higher, uh, higher standard elite uh, food. And the chain was bought by Amazon in 2017. So there was already this idea that elite food connects with logistics and connects with um, online purchasing. But what is interesting is that very few people talked about is that before being so being bought by Amazon, the firm, the Whole Food, was highly invested and highly participated by financial investors and financial capital, BlackRock <coughs> and in, in particular, who had already bet on the fact that Whole Food and the Whole Food model would become appealing and would become a term of reference for this elite market. But of course, when I happened to enter in Whole Foods before they, uh, that they sold to Amazon. There was no way in which I could know that instead of being a local, a local, but like a family run supermarket or retail chain as they presented themselves, it was actually run by financial investors headquartered in New York. So, a lot of problems also on both uh, extremes of the retail of the, of the, of the sector. <coughs> when it comes to uh, financialization. Another area that I think is, has to be investigated, and particularly now after the mega acquisition of Monsanto by Bayer, is that of seeds. So who owns our seeds and who owns the seeds and who owns the seeds? A lot that can be said about privatization of seeds and nature, but it's not what I want to talk about. I just want to say a few words about the fact that we look at Bayer and Monsanto as two corporations. In reality, what Bayer and Monsanto are, are corporations that are owned by selling financial uh, investors. So one of the top investors in Bayer was uh, BlackRock, as you can see, like 3%, and BlackRock was also the second investor in Monsanto. So percentages like that don't say a lot, but it looks like a very little percentage. But what is important is that in a very dispersed ownership like that of Bayer and Monsanto, even small percentages of the overall package of share can give the possibility to make decisions. And something that happened before the merger gives us an example of what it really means to be in the same financial investors and owing share in two potentially competitive uh, firms. So there was a moment where DuPont and Monsanto so two seeds companies, where according to uh, as Hedge Fund, which was one investor in Monsanto, they were not competing enough. So the Hedge Fund manager said, we are not operating in a way that is competitive, we could do better than DuPont, why are we keeping the prices so high, why are we not doing research and development, why are we operating in the way that we are operating, we should do something. We should change our strategy. And the decision to change the strategy and to act aggressively against Monsanto was denied by the shareholders uh, because the same shareholders in DuPont were the shareholders in Monsanto. So if you look at the first two shareholders, Bazaar and Blackrock, mm -hmm. that was the same. And so economic theory is telling us that firms have an incentive in competing if they can extract more value out of competing out or driving out the market the other competitor. They have an incentive towards not competing if by controlling by any sort of horizontal agreement, they can extract resources from both sides. So when you have 
the same financial investors on both sides, they don't really have an incentive into attacking each other or lowering the margin, lowering the profit. They have an incentive into maintaining the situation as it is and extracting high margin and high profit on both sides. Mm -hmm. So that's open the entire question about competition law and horizontal shareholding, which Jennifer Club is, is, is working on, which I think also poses questions whether or not competition law can really make a difference. So I, I have my own feeling, my own. Uh, Final ideas about that, but I think that it's important to show that horizontal ownership is leading towards anti competitive dynamics, and these anti competitive dynamics are then fed by the farmers. So, if you read the arguments that Iris Group was presenting against the Bayer Monsanto uh, merger, they were about the cost that farmers were being incurred when buying fertilizers of seed. So, Living Center Fund should not buy them, they should reduce them in 653. But if they are acting, acting anti-competitively, that means the farmers are going to get money, and we have seen what it means for farmers specifically in the global south. So this is not visible if you don't think about finance. So it's important to think about financial option. And then quickly, to the last point, uh, the last example, which is uh, that of, of land, which is where I started from. So land is, uh, a scarce resource. Right? Uh, there is not land generated every, every day. And there is something that I think that a lot of policymakers have not understood, but a lot of financial investors have understood. And they have understood that if you invest your money into something that is so scarce and precious, you can make a lot of money out of that. So the amount of uh, funds that have been created just to look at agricultural investment and just to look at land and putting the money to land in order to generate revenues has exponentially increased in the last years. Specifically, after 2010, land became not only for corporations, but also specifically for financial investors, particularly interested. And that in all geographies. So we see that money is coming from the global north and going to the global south. Money is coming from the global north and staying in the global north. Money is coming from emerging countries and going. Uh, to emerging countries. So it is not really about geography, it is about where wealth is concentrated. And that concentration of wealth goes and looks for land as an opportunity to generate revenues that other investment cannot generate anymore. So one of the drivers we will see later is the fact that land is much more reliable financially than speculative uh, items on the market. So, Plenty of reason, as I said, land is a scarce resource. Um, land allows to diversify. So these are all elements and arguments that I've been reading when investors justify why they are looking at land. Uh, you probably spot that there is very little about agriculture, very little about the importance of giving specific system. It's all about the amount of money that we can extract from land. Um, so and also, beside the, the reasons why they did it, like different ways in which financial investors engage with land. So, some financial investors, they actually bought the land and they set up companies and they wanted to be farmers. And this is something that one of these, uh, the ISS has been studying a lot and it's been constantly facing failures. <coughs> constantly seeing the fact that those financial investors, even with a lot of resources, were incapable of producing what they wanted and to maintain the economic standards that they were expecting. So saying a lot about the fact that agriculture is not something that we just can make up on one day. <coughs> in practice, even if we have a lot of money. Increasingly, uh, financial investors obtain concessions, particularly in the global south. Um, a case that I was involved in is a case called palm oil plantations in Cameroon, where the firm that obtained the concession was a private equity farm. And the the difference that it made between a private equity fund and a corporation interested in palm oil was that they had as their business plan, as their, as their strategy, the remuneration of their investors at 12% a year. So they had to implement a system of agriculture capital <coughs> generating 12% return every year, which is 
very high, but also means that things have to be done in a very aggressive way. Products have to be produced with the lowest cost possible labor, with the lowest cost possible land. Mm -hmm. Because if they have not been capable of rewarding their investors, their entire activity would have collapsed. And that made us a little bit better for us acting against them, because <coughs> by stopping them for five years, they eventually saw all their investors withdrawing, which was, which was very good. Um, and then you see very other uh, ways, including um, universities endowments, like Harvard endowment, pension scheme <coughs> by the USS, uh, the end, the teachers uh, scheme in the United States, that are invested in land because they think that land is a, is a good and appropriate investment for the long term. And they do that because they have to guarantee a certain return every year. So we see increasingly institutional investors like pension funds, insurance, <coughs> etc. that look at land as a security, look at land as a safe asset, and they don't really care about the implications that, that may have on the ground. They care about the implications that they may have in terms of paying their members, paying their pensions, and etc. So, of course, what happens is that the presence of the financial investors on the ground is not as evident. Like the same that happened to me when I was to an, in Whole Food. I entered Whole Food and I didn't know that it was on the black line. A lot of investment happened on the ground and it's not very easy to know where the money is coming from. So there is a, a large investigation that is going on in Brazil about the interaction between the Swedish pension fund and land in the Cerrado in Brazil. And it took years for FIA and International that is investigating that to actually get a sense of where the money was coming from, how was the money channeled, and not this financial complexity that is making very hard to organize, that is making very hard to resist. But the list goes on and on, and I, and I don't really have time to, to look at all the cases. But any time that you see a large manager, any time that you see large investments, any time that you see uh, a significant change in the global system, be sure that there is financial investors and financial investment behind that. Um, so, all of that was to give examples, and as I, as I told to Chris and, and, and Rosie yesterday, um, I was lucky or unlucky enough to find a video uh, that was made by BlackRock, which is the largest, considered the largest shadow bank in the world. BlackRock is a private equity firm that manages $5.7 trillion. And if you think that the GDP of Japan is $4.3 trillion, you can get a sense of the, of the size. They have seven offices in 50 countries. They're clients from 100 uh, countries. They launched two um, international investment uh, funds that specifically targeted agriculture and food system. So I... Uh, by accident, I discovered that they made a six-minute promotional video of why they are investing in agriculture and in the sector. And I think that they are much better than I am in explaining the way in which financial <coughs> motives and financial desires and financial opportunities are not only investing in the food sector because it's reliable and because it's rentable, but also determining what food sector is food sector of the future. They are picking and choosing those specific forms of production, those specific geographies, those specific consumption habits that they think will be capable of giving them the return on the investment that they expect. So I was thinking of showing the video and then having a few final remarks, if you don't mind, also because I didn't speak for 35 minutes. Um, and the idea is to look at that and to pay attention at the details and to pay attention at how much they are naturalizing or how much they are normalizing what they are doing and specifically to engage with that and say <clears throat> are they those who we allow to think about future of food and are these the people who should determine how the food system will look like in the future. So I will let you do it, I think that's called Desmond and <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I 
is Richard James. Hello, I'm Desmond Chan. <laughs> Yeah, we have the best professionals that Richard Davis. Hello, I'm Desmond Sharp. We are the managers of the DGF World Agriculture Fund. So why is agricultural good investment opportunity? Well, in the long term, we believe that demand for agricultural products is going to grow strongly. Against that background, inventories have been run down to low levels. So as commodity prices move higher, farms will be incentivized to increase supply. And that's where the investment opportunity lies. This fund is investing in companies that provide inputs to farmers. They sell fertilizers or seeds or chemicals or equipment to farmers. And as farmers grow more, crops increase their supply, they will be using more of those goods and services. In terms of what Desmond and I do on a day-to-day -day basis, we research companies. Uh, we don't sit down and try and work out what the price of a commodity will be in the next quarter or the future. Uh, we don't do that, we research equities. Now, part of that research involves traveling to some of these companies. Today, every tractor runs four big seats on So it's a much more complex machine than it used to be. Over the years, well, farmers have improved the technology that they apply farming. For the use of uh, modern technology, farmers will be able to use precision farming technique to apply fertilizer and seed in order to reduce the wastage. This is especially relevant when fertilizer and chemical prices are rising. And are the tractors becoming bigger in China? Are they going up in terms of all power of China surprised us with the volumes and the sophistication that they pay for their tractors. The tractors are all, all pre-installed in software, so they have to work immediately. Tractors like this are actually heavy capital investment for farmers. In the past, when farms are of very, very small size, well, farmers will simply not be able to justify this type of investment. But right now, with the consolidation of small farms around the world, especially in developing markets, farmers will actually see the scalability of farming operation to justify this sort of capital investment decision. This has been a very interesting trip because we've been able to speak to people working at that plant rather than the CEOs, and we do get a different perspective on the business. We've also got some useful information, not only on the markets for equipment in the UK, but more importantly globally, particularly at places like China. In this field, the farm is growing wheat, and the yield here is expected to be very good, around 10 tons per hectare, which is much better than the global average, which is about 3 tons per hectare. The farmer has bought good quality seeds, the farmer will use fertilizer and pesticides and herbicides, and that's why the yield is good. Farmers right now are in a very strong position to really test into the farming operation. So products like this that we see here, including fertilizer, chemicals, and seed, farmers are actually spending more money on these products so that they make sure that they can get a good yield out of the farms. So one of the main drivers behind the demand for agricultural crops is population growth. And it's estimated between now and 2050, the world's population will grow from 6 billion to 9 billion. That's roughly the population of the United Kingdom being added every year. If we look at well, how much more food do we actually need to provide to this growing population, we are actually seeing that bulk of that population growth is going to come from emerging markets. Demand for protein is growing globally, and this is because people are becoming wealthier. In Asia, for example, incomes are going up, and one of the first things people do once they reach a certain income level is improve their diet, and they do that by eating more protein. And this has very significant consequences for farmers, because they need to grow more crops in order to feed those animals. So, for example, here we have a 25 kilogram bag of feed, and we feed this to these pigs, or only get about 8 kilograms of pork meat. If we were to feed this to some cattle, we'd only get about three kilograms of beef. Chinese protein consumption is increasing, and if China goes to the same level as Korea on the capital basis in terms of protein consumption, their demand for protein will increase by 27%, which on a global basis will represent a 9% increase in global protein demand. Agriculture is a young and growing sector, especially in emerging markets. That's why governments is playing a very strong role in order to promote the cost of farming standards. What we saw last year is that the Brazilian government stepped in and provided billions of dollars of liquidity to farmers so that they can improve the productivity on the farms, either by means of upgrading the equipment they use or to properly apply fertilizer, seeds, and chemicals that they urgently need. We've got some wheat here. Now, global wheat stocks are relatively high at the moment. 
and that's why the weak price is quite depressed. But the high level of stocks is good for some of our investments because companies like Bungie and Archer Daniels, who are involved in buying the crop off farmers, transporting it and storing it, do well when volumes are high. Biofuel production is one of the key demand drivers behind agriculture. With all the government mandates in place around the world, the world is going to need more food in order to feed into this growing sector. Myself and Desmond are part of the natural resources team, which consists of about 10 fund managers, which focuses on commodity equities. In the case of agriculture, fertilizer companies are mining companies that we've been following for a long time. In the case of biofuel sector, we have been investing in this sector over the years in the new energy world. In BlackRock, we are a big company, but that has its advantages. When Desmond and I want to meet companies, we have very good access to the senior management of some of the biggest companies in the world in the agricultural sector. We can capitalize on the fact that we have investment professionals around the world with a global reach to companies in order to pick up the right investment opportunities at the right time. We believe this is a very good long-term story. The fundamentals over the last decade have been improving. We haven't launched this fund in order to catch up an 18-month or a two-year period of good performance. We've launched this fund because we believe over the next 5, 10 to 15 years, we can make substantial returns from investing in agricultural equity. So, I'm I'm pretty worried, and and I personally that that's why I think it's important that, that we look at finance because when a financial investor tells us that they think there is money they can extract for the next 15 years. I think that that means that the challenge is there as we are in a very, very hard and deathly uh, battle uh, with the appropriate tools. So, I don't have solutions, uh, of course, but we can talk about that later if you're interested. What I, what I end up reflecting on is that it's really important that speculation is not the only way in which finance is changing, is modifying the global system. Actually, the presence of financial investors and the presence of financial motives is pushing one specific vision of the system and is determining or is trying to determine the future of our food. So, of course, the model in which they are investing is the model that is considered to be reliable, stable, and it generates 3% a year, which is considered to be a decent return on the investment. And that requires standardization, homogenization that requires large scale, that requires the kind of agriculture that can be transformed into a financial investment. So they have an inherent <coughs> desire, an inherent need of transforming the food sector, the agriculture sector in particular, in that specific model where they can apply fertilizer and chemicals, where they can rely on four traders like uh, like Kaki or Monge in order to transport and store the, the, the food and etc. Of course, that also has significant implication in terms of concentration and power. So the first image is that of a very concentrated and very unequal uh, food sector where a few corporations decide and determine what we're eating. But if you take finance and you think about the vertical integration of the system, you think about the fact that the same actors are operating at different levels and throughout competing companies. At the end of the day, those who decide how the global food system looks like, and that can also have a direct implication on the life of farmers and consumers, are even less players concentrated in few geographies in the world, in few cities in the world, like London, New York, that have access to this trillion dollars that have seen uh, and that have seen agriculture as a as a good uh, as a good investment. But I think what the two most important points that I would like to develop in the future, the first one is the direct or indirect implication in terms of product to food. So it's not only about how it's changing, but also what are the implications in terms of food security, food insecurity, and access, access to food. And that's why I titled it Investing in Hunger. So they show, uh, sort of, I think BlackRock says that they want to provide food to feed everyone. But there are also possible implications in the way that they will decide that they will going to be producing food only for certain people in the world and only those who can afford it, and they will immediately accept hunger and starvation and food insecurity because economically and financially that makes sense not to produce food for people who cannot afford it. 
And also, and that's the point that I would conclude on, is the sort of strengthening and, and, and normalization of the, of the narrative. So these are just a few statements that you can easily find online, like Googling, financial investors, and food security. So there has been a strong appropriation of the notion of food security and food insecurity, but even more, this idea that food insecurity is connected to lack of productivity and that by producing more, we can actually make uh, people food secure. And I think that if that, that has already been accepted by some countries, that has already been accepted by some international organizations that also get strengthened and reinforced by those who put the money and decide how the food system looks like, I think the struggle is even, is even stronger and the struggle for the recognition of the problems with the distribution, the recognition of the problems of accessibility, the recognition of, of the real issue and systemic issue behind uh, food insecurity uh, become even harder. So, I'm sure the core is the right place where to start this conversation and, I, and, I, and I'm happy to, to be here because I think that it's something that requires not only lawyers and people interested in finance but people operating throughout the food system to start thinking all together about how we can make it more visible, how can we expose it and how we can engage both to limit what is going on and also to present alternatives. And on this potentially positive note of that would be amazing to work together, I think that I will 